Perfect. So, hello everyone. My name is Milka Moyans, and I am the I pretty much lead the Hacking HR Miami chapter. I'm one of the co-hosts there, and I'm coming to you um, from Miami uh, in this session. And um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a leadership consultant and organizational consultant, and I work at the intersection of bringing organizations and people together to create more people-centered organizational models that help to solve more complex problems, but at the same time driven by leadership that is has, that, that at the same time is driven by organizations with a much more expansive view of leadership. I've been working as a consultant for the past 13 or so years now, and um, I work with global organizations, and I have a particular passion for this topic, thinking and doing innovation. It's, near, it's close and near and dear to my heart, and it's an area where I've written books on women and entrepreneurship, uh, co-written books in this topic, and um, about some of the case studies related to uh, Miami, which is actually one of the leading cities for women entrepreneurs in the United States. And uh, I've also done work with different organizations to look differently at how they bring um, creative thinking, design thinking ideas into the organization. So I'm really excited about this panel and the group of panelists that we've brought here today. Um, you are certainly in for a treat. And we have uh, management gurus, design thinking, um, empresarials. We have people, um, some of our panelists are essentially uh, at the head of this movement, we think about innovation and the expertise that they bring to the table across academia as well as the private sector and also the public sector. Uh, it's, it's actually quite fascinating to see the intersection of all the different areas that uh, in ex levels of expertise that all of these panels panelists bring to the table. So for the next hour, we are going to be talking about everything that has to do with innovation, from the theory of it to how it can be better applied. And so that it's not just some uh, idea that's a pie, that's just something that's out there, but really we're not sure how to do it better. And as you know, since this is Hacking HR, and it's a Hacking HR conference, um, our primary focus is the HR function. How do we, and part of Hacking HR's mission is bringing together sometimes often strange bedfellows, others who are not in the HR function, uh, technologists, uh, design thinkers, academics uh, who work within HR or outside of HR, uh, management experts, bringing all of these people together to help us to rethink and reimagine how HR can do work differently. And so without further ado, um, I would like for each of the panelists, starting with Jamie, to introduce himself, who he is, what he does, how he does it, and um, why is he excited about this topic? Yeah. So, okay, thanks, Milka. I mean, that, that was quite a build up. You know, I'm kind of, a, I'm a big believer that the secret to happiness in life is low expectations. So you, you've now kind of put the bar quite high. So we, we, we now have to look up to that, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm Gary Anderson, I'm Australian, uh, living in, in Belgium, and I'm a professor of strategy and innovation management. Uh, and yeah, a lot of what I do is work with senior executives and, and leadership teams in organizations and help them to, to really deal with complexity. So, so my thing is what I call creative leadership, uh, and it's all about really helping people to, to address some of the big challenges that we're facing in the world right now, you know, whether it's digitalization, uh, globalization or even actually this week the coronavirus because we have this incredible disruption happening right now here in Europe um, and it's really pushing leaders and, and organizations to, to rethink um, but of course tonight what we focus on, on is, is much more um, the, the impact of technology on organizations and how we'll be preparing people for jobs of the future uh, and in that context you know of course working with leaders and senior people organizations I also do work a lot with uh, HR organizations, um, particularly with regard to learning and development and, and how, how helping to, to upskill people. So that's kind of, kind of what I do. And when I'm not you know, working and, and teaching and, and stuff, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sportsman, I'm a cyclist. So if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see that when I'm not, uh, yeah, not working and teaching, I'm thinking out of my bicycle. So good to be you here. Were just you were just cycling in Morocco last week, weren't you? Yeah, I was. I had my first race last, last week in Morocco, yeah. Cool. So good Wonderful. to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Jeff, can you please introduce yourself? 
Absolutely. Uh, th thank you, Milka. It's an honor to be here. My name is Jeff Cavanaugh, coming to you from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, I lead the Knowledge Institute, the Emphasis Knowledge Institute, the research arm of Emphasis. Uh, have been at this for, for some time, have been um, leading business units in the company, a lot of manufacturing work, uh, usually looking at the intersection of people and technology and the economic part of it, because even in a triple bottom line world, you've got to have the financial part as well. And over the years, I've been able to do a lot uh, with the HR function, We've led HR or led uh, recruiting or talent acquisition for our firm. Uh, well, like Jamie, I'm associated with the University of Texas at Dallas and the faculty there. And I've been a fair amount of writing as well, like Milka had a book come out on uh, core professional skills, especially the things that um, address the talent gap you know, things like critical thinking, design thinking, uh, kind of communications that actually help get all those great thoughts through inside of people to where somebody can, can listen, understand them, and act on them. Uh, beyond that, uh, these days I'm helping people find their voice. Uh, some uh, female entrepreneurs, like in Europe, we just did a session, series of sessions at Abbey Road Studios in London, which was a blast, and got the word out about uh, how people can be better represented in society. Uh, as well as accessing capital and accessing education. Uh, like Jamie as well, uh, do have some other hobbies. Tennis is mine, not so much cycling. <clears throat> and if you happen to be a South by Southwest in, in a week or two, uh, we actually have a session on the future of tennis wow. and the female coach of Quality Lounge. Uh, come on down. Very so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Salima. Jeff, I actually will be in Dallas in a few weeks. I actually might just hit you up on that because I'm a big tennis fan as well and usually try to go to the, the Miami Tennis Open when I can. Awesome. Thank you. Salima, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. My name is Salima Villani, and I'm an innovation strategist um, in my organization. I'm a co-founder at Innovazing, and uh, basically we're all about helping companies navigate change, especially digital transformation, uh, using innovation and design thinking. And so this includes whether it's upskilling, reskilling, and 21st century skills, which design thinking and adaptability, resilience, a lot of those um, skills are becoming increasingly important. Uh, we are in the future of work already, and so uh, this is all very, very interesting stuff. Um, I'm also an innovation consultant at the World Bank, and I teach design thinking and entrepreneurship at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies here in Washington, D.C. And I'm actually uh, in the process of uh, publishing my first book. Uh, it's called Innovation Starts with I. I've been on a I've been on co-authored several publications, but this is my first book, so I'm really excited about that. And it basically aims to redefine innovation and that um, bring up the right. human element in innovation. That innovation starts with the mindset and happens it starts with the the individual and happens with uh, teams and with the we and impacts the world. So, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Thank Thank you so much, Salima. And and what I love so much about this group of panelists is just the interdisciplinary perspective that you all bring to the table. You're pulling in from so many different disciplines. You work across many different industries, functions, and I think that's fascinating and a great way to set the context of how we start thinking about the very idea of innovation and going from the theory of it all to the application, the practicality of how do you bring this to life so it's not constantly the idea of, okay, it's product development or it's shiny object syndrome, but it's really, you start thinking about mindsets and skills and behaviors and how that starts to shift how organizations work more effectively. So to kick it off, uh, so, so just so everybody's clear on the, the format of our panel, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share some data, some information, and then I'm going to ask the questions of which, a question of which each of the panelists is going to respond to. They've had time to think about some of these questions. They will each have about five minutes to respond to the question, and then they will um, add some additional comments um, as is necessary. So the first point I wanna make is a recent survey that was conducted by the Center for Creative Leadership, CCL, identified 500, 500 leaders, and of those leaders, they believe that a key driver to success for any organization is 94% of them believe a key driver for success is innovation. Yet 77 promoted it in some fashion, and more interestingly, 14% were believed that they were confident that their organization does innovation very well. As you can see, there's a clear gap between the idea of aspiring towards being more innovative in large organizations, and then the reality of implementing it when you have only 14% believing that they do 
innovation will in the organization. So my first question to all of you is, in your respective role and also work, in what capacity have you collaborated or consulted with the HR, the HR function? What strengths do you find that they brought to the table? And what opportunities or perhaps uh, weaknesses uh, do you feel uh, were a bit more challenging and might actually hamper uh, innovation in, in the workspace? Uh, Salima, perhaps you would like to first crack at this. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I um, can tell a few different stories, but I'd say that um, just as I mentioned that innovation starts with I, I, I really believe that it starts with um, the individual when it comes to organization. It really takes the champion or a leader to really uh, believe in innovation, to create a psychologically safe environment uh, for innovation to thrive. Uh, oftentimes in organizations, we see that um, innovation can be siloed to an innovation lab where it's like a safe space for them to test things. But within HR, it can be really challenging because in many organizations, HR is just isolated. And that's just the truth that it's sort of like, ah, it's HR, they're isolated. And, and it can be sort of, there's like a, a certain feeling in certain organizations, especially cultures that in certain organizational cult cultures that may be more traditional where HR is very, very isolated. And so um, in some organizations, we see that being decentralized, some of those HR functions being decentralized to other parts of the organization. However, for the innovation to happen, I really believe that it takes um, a champion and Oftentimes, um, when it's not like, for example, one way that we've worked with organizations is we're sort of the external firm that comes with a different perspective and we come and partner and co-create uh, with the organization, but we can ask questions and do the analysis, the, the mix of quantitative and qualitative analysis, whether it's you know focus groups, um, interviews, surveys, really trying to figure out what's the situation beyond just employee engagement surveys and really understand the problem because oftentimes we're coming up with solutions and thinking about solutions without really understanding the problem. And so having that external sort of unbiased um, view or, or way of trying to understand the problem makes a big difference. And that's sort of like where we come in. Um, I would also say that um, we've seen a lot of like, a lot of opportunities, a lot of organizations that we've been working with are trying to upskill and reskill their employees and skills like design thinking and are really pushing for this um, kind of like having the innovative mindset across the entire organization's culture. Um, however, it feels a little bit sometimes like it's a check in the box and it's a nice to have and not a need to have. And this is something that I think it's it's hard to see the, the results sometimes in terms of quantifying. How do you see the results of training employees in this skill? Um, at the end of the day, maybe going to design thinking workshop, you'll have some aha moments, you'll get inspired, but is that really gonna make a difference? And I think that we need to move beyond just doing design sprints and doing these things, but really creating you know, a safe space and, and finding a way to really embed it in the culture uh, and create more uh, entrepreneurs allow people to to bring their ideas to the table we've seen companies like google that you know they they give the 20 percent um work on a project that you that you want to you're passionate about or that interests you there's some organizations that that create that space um however many many organizations are still very very uh to say like for my book ashley interviewed alex osterwalder that uh created the business model canvas and he stated that you know uh, most companies, like most companies, are at least ten years behind in innovation, and so right now it's a very interesting time because a lot of companies need to catch up. Um, some of them that are stalling, or some of them that are gonna start stalling very soon if they don't pick up. But it's just really scary to see that there's so much turnover happening, and how do you really retain um, people that are uh, very talented and maybe very entrepreneurial? And we keep seeing a, it's a big loss when we lose people, and and you know, right. in our and so that's something that um, I think that it's both a challenge and opportunity. Uh, I also wanted to mention that diversity and inclusion is also an interesting space. Uh, we tap into that as well a little bit with um, bringing inclusion into the conversation, inclusion as a catalyst for innovation. And it's not just in innovation and in it's not just about, you know, some people hear DNI, they hear diversity and inclusion and they think like, oh, it's just, you know, unconscious bias and all of that stuff. But I really think mm -hmm. that design thinking and innovation uh, is really about inclusion and involving different stakeholders and understanding and engaging with different stakeholders. It requires the skill of community building and really listening to different voices and including different people in the conversation. And so I think that's gonna be on the rise, the people that can have those people skills, those human skills to really listen and, and empathize and understand uh, the different generations that they work with, the different cultures that they work with, the different voices that they hear. I think that people that uh, are able to really jump on that are gonna thrive. Uh, especially with the the, the jobs are uh, you know the shift the, the shift that we're going to see in the jobs. 
Wonderful. That's uh, you brought up uh, so many different interesting points, um, and I and I actually would love to hear if Jamie or Jeff had anything mm. more uh, that they would like to add. I, I certainly have I can I have follow up questions to some of your thoughts, yeah. Salima, but I'm curious if Jamie and Jeff has anything more they would like to add to that. Yeah, I, I guess as I was listening to Salima, you know, one of the a lot of the stuff she was talking about is really thinking long term, and also in a way guiding the, the business and and i think one of the big shifts which well when i step into organization and i say hr i ask myself you know is, is this a hr which is a butler to the business and when i say a butler to the business in the old industrial world you know basically the business or leaders or managers went to hr and said this is what we want deliver it for us right. whether it was in terms of job profiles job descriptions it was training, development, whatever it might be. So the HR function is very, in a way, responsive. Um, however, I think now when we start talking about the big shifts that we're seeing in the world, that HR can't be a butler to the business anymore. In fact, you know, the HR has to be thinking not just about you know, doing the business today, but doing the business the day after tomorrow. And that's a big shift, and I, I think I don't see enough of that in HR organizations. I don't see enough of the HR organization really being visionary and actually, in a way, trying to guide the business on on future developments and, and future trends, um, because that means having a much more strategic view and also being really credible at the table and not simply being right. a butler to the business. So that's what I would bring in. I think Selena touched on many of those things because what she's talking about is really changing culture, you know, changing the environment, and you can't do that from an HR department, which is a butler to the business. You can only do that as an HR professional if you're seen as a peer to the business. Right, wonderful. Thank you, Jamie. Jeff, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add, any comments you'd like to make on this particular topic? Sure, sure. And without going over ground they've already covered, I think on the strength side, the HR organization uniquely brings intent and credibility that they care about people because the people is the organization. And while a lot of other organizations or functions can say that, I think there's some credibility I already started. I've done a fair amount of work with the Edelman organizations and worldwide PR firm. They have this thing called the trust index, trust mm -hmm. barometer. And it's unfortunate, but probably not surprising that the trust is pretty low in, in several uh, areas, both geographically, functionally, different institutions. And I think the HR organization has, uh, has an opportunity, there's direct line of sight to people and at least a running start for credibility. I think in the weaknesses, um, I do like the butler to the business. That's a ni nice, nice, nice phrase. And unfortunately, it's true. I think that the HR organizations have gone, leaders have gone from a administrative function to at least a, a kind of cheerleading or more advocacy function, but it's not enough. And, and I think having a more strategic role, the seat at the table literally, and to be viewed more as core to the business, and I probably cover it in a few questions later, just this idea that bringing the facts to bear, we all know that it's a pain to replace somebody, but whenever those facts are shoved in your face, how much it costs, the productivity lost, you can't expand, there's a lot of you know, dominoes that fall. If that is put forward to some senior executives, then it's a little bit easier for the HR leader to have that seat at the table and to be in the discussions, because then it becomes an operational discussion and a strategic discussion, uh, just beyond talent and hiring, things like that. One, um, one interesting exception I've seen was, um, you know, to, to the negative that HR isn't playing a strategic role, uh, a former client at Toyota Financial Services. Uh, they're unique and innovative in many ways. Uh, I mentioned them by name just because I think it's a very positive example. The Chief Human Resources Officer was also their head of strategy. Oh, wow. And I haven't seen that very yeah. often. And it gave them a different viewpoint because so many of their people are talking with customers. They're on the front lines. And I think that gave them, if you look at their performance, it's been pretty darn good as a financial services organization. And I think that the interplay between the chief human resources officer also thinking about strategy for the, for the company gave them a leg up. And, and I think what I find interesting is that all three of you touched upon different facets of the challenges that HR often face, uh, where uh, Jeff, you said something that, that was really interesting, it was the idea from just going from doing more administrative, perhaps more reactive, re reactionary uh, work uh, to much more 
moving more towards perhaps advocacy or cheerleading uh, to actually becoming much more strategic in how data is better used how HR and strategy and operations start to come together and that person who's leading that function is more uh, have, have um, more of a, I, I suppose, a, a breadth of understanding of how the organization functions beyond just doing benefits or talent retention and what perhaps HR has been doing most of, uh, has been doing a lot of in, in the past. So you all bring a very unique uh, perspective that was interesting. Uh, Salima, you mentioned something about problem definitions very early on. And uh, that, that stuck out to me because one of the issues or challenges that uh, HR leaders might find themselves at times is they, there's a lot of ambiguity because there's a lot of new technology and the technology is driving a lot of the change. And very often the, the technology is just being brought in um, from the chief technology officer of another part of the business is also impacting um, the talent function in the, in the HR organization. Um, I'm just curious if even, and any one of you perhaps might want to um, you know, touch upon this idea, but how to better define certain issues or problems, um, any approaches that um, from a micro level really, any ideas or thoughts on how do you better create that problem definition and have an organization that's able to do that much more effectively. And that becomes part of how the organization, how the HR organization uh, better solves problems, particularly more complex problems in the organization. Yeah, so I guess I can start by, I think it comes down to understanding the different stakeholders at place. And I think that oftentimes the issue that I've, I've seen in the organizations I've worked with or is that HR, people think that HR, like operations thinks that HR doesn't understand them. And they are like, oh, this is like another training or HR. And it's just like very, very, there's like some there's hard feelings between feelings towards HR in some of these organizations. And so interestingly, um, I think that it's about really understanding and, and finding a way to give the HR um, professional the experience of what it's like on the other side in different parts of the organization and really understand and empathize by actually being there versus just try to like, you know, create policies and be on the other side and be very isolated. And I think that even they're like oftentimes in different buildings and different, completely different units. And it just, right. how do you really build policies and, and make change or, or like understand people if you're not understanding what, what's their day to day, what's their daily challenges and, and this and that. And so it's not just from surveys, it's really understanding um, what's it like to be in their shoes. And I think that's what, that something like that needs to happen where everyone is included in that conversation, but not just from a sort of, um, you know, come not just the ones that are the champions or the ones that um, are into all of this, that like support or advocate for like, yes, we need to do stuff within HR, but everyone else that maybe sort of feels not included in the conversation, if that makes sense. I think something like that, I don't have the solution, but I really think it just, there needs to be more conversations and more inclusion happening. Um, I also think that uh, just more decentralization, I think that uh, not just a, of HR and like everything else, I think there needs to just be um, different roles where people have different functions and it's not just like HR just takes care of this or change management sits here. The organization needs to adapt and change. It's not necessarily from change management um, all the time. It has to be mm -hmm. something bigger that includes a lot more stakeholders. And so, so I would say, yeah, like just really understanding the problem um, takes those conversations, the space, um, it takes innovation, it takes, uh, there's different ways organizations, like I've seen, um, you know, hackathons, I've seen um, like idea thons and like uh, in encouraging staff to bring some of these things to the table and some of their ideas and some of the problems um, that can be shared using technology even in the internet or however they do it on, on their social platforms, um, doing design thinking to understand like what are the problems uh, and incentivizing employees to, to pitch and to, uh, yeah, share their solutions and ideas. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so um, unless anyone else, uh, Jeff or Jamie, you'd like to add anything more, uh, I'd like to move to the next question. Okay. All right. So the World Economic Forum's 2018 report projected that 75 million jobs will be replaced due to automation. About 133 million new roles will be created within five years. The Brookings Institute, as far as in North America goes, states that about 30 million jobs will be lost in the next few years uh, in the United States alone. Uh, this begs uh, quite a few questions around what role HR can play in this new uh, world that we're moving towards very quickly. Uh, my first question is, 
is the human resources function globally equipped to effectively lead this transition? And then a the follow-up to that is do leaders and organizations and the HR function have a moral obligation to soften the impact of artificial intelligence and automation on the global workforce? Uh, either one of you can uh, kick off, either Jeff or Jamie. Ronnie, why don't you start, Jeff? Because that, that's a big question. <laughs> all right, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, first of all, I guess just to be provocative, no, they're not ready. Uh, I, partly for the reason we talked about before, because to be ready means you can project your influence as a strategic advisor in the company. Uh, I think also it's this idea that HR is a function and not as much part of operations. Not that you need to put HR under the COO, just just view it more as fundamental to the operations of a company. Uh, in a world where technology, while it's complex and few of us understand what's under the hood, it is becoming more and more mature, more dependable. For example, doing something in the cloud, you're 30 minutes from provisioning across two or three different major cloud providers, and you can set up what would have been a, a week's long effort not too many years ago. But figuring out the people part of it, hiring and the other aspects, retaining, developing, motivating, it, it, it's, it's a big deal. So no, I don't think they're ready. Uh, but the good news yeah. is there are some forward-looking companies. I think that the big thing is the uh, once they're seen as company leaders, a lot of other things will happen. Uh, I think that the moral obligation part, yes, but, yes, because they have a line of sight, yes, because they literally are thinking about people, the 360 view of getting them on board, their training or development, their retention, uh, and of course the employee surveys and things like that. But they also need to be seen as financial leaders. If there is a triple bottom line and you care about environment and government, ESG, you do care about financials. And if you don't integrate that and relate it, then you will be relegated to a side function, you know, functional leader role. So there's a yes, but it isn't, well, HR has got the people part covered. No, no, no. They also need to worry about the financial part. And I still, again, go, keep going back to this. When you lay out the business case of what it truly takes to replace someone, the business disruption, the, the length of time, the amount, whether you use a recruiter or whether you do it internally and retraining and the loss, it is a huge number. And all of us, I think, take for granted when things run smoothly. But we're all lean, at least in our business operations. So when a person leaves, it's chaos. So over investing, like in your personal life when you buy insurance, you know, what's that worth? Not to have that so you can be customer centric and develop and be more innovative. So and the last piece is, if so, how? I think learning platforms, uh, these, these things that project and put the ability to learn at a very low cost or free in a very flexible way, especially with cognitive adaptability, where it adopts to people's styles, people have different ways of learning, that is something people can do, isn't terribly expensive and it's incredibly useful. Back to you. Jeff, you made a very interesting distinction at the beginning where you made a distinction between HR being a function um, versus fundamentally, uh, the versus being fundamental to the function of the organization. Can you mm -hmm. extrapolate a little bit more on that? Because uh, very often we hear about how we live, we work and live in a knowledge economy now. And what that basically means is the old industrial model is gone, it's no longer viable. And now, it, white collar workers or workers who primarily are doing work that is more information or digital based um, changes the shape of organization. But yet we're still holding on to these old industrial command control models and how we work. What role do you think in, what role do you think HR can play in helping to actually make that shift beyond just we talk about it, but until we see new organizations being created, it seems to be very difficult for these older paradigms to shift. Well, real, real quick, I'm back on my colleagues, I think one point is, I think you've conflated two things. One is there is an old model, a new model. The other is it is as important to do some of the old work because there's a yes. physical aspect. If everything runs to being these apps on your phone, people have to make stuff. People have to transport goods. Even in a 3D printing world, things get moved. Actions mm -hmm. take place. So I think it's a knowledge economy, but it's also an action economy and you must produce something. And I think 
the technology allows the difference in the organizational models. You just still have to respect whether it's the blue collar worker or the blue collar activity because it also retains this tangible function because sometimes in a, in a digital world, you feel disconnected. I think the connection is important. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I'm, I mean, uh, Jeff, you said, you know, sort of HR organizations are not ready. I mean, for, in, in my experience, it really depends on the industry, the sector we're looking at. You know, I mean, I, I do a lot of work with kind of the big brains consultancies. And, and in those organizations, the HR function is really core to what they do, right? Because yeah. it's all about the ability to identify, attract, and retain talent. So mm -hmm. I think if I, I'm not going to name names, but certainly some of those really big, as I say, brains-based consultancies, which are really understanding that they have to be at the forefront of knowledge and expertise. Yeah. HR, I think, is, is, is doing it in those organizations, must and, and is doing a pretty good job. However, you know, I also work, and again, I won't name the company, but I work with a very large automotive company based in Germany currently. Um, and it's, it's frightening to see what's happening in an organization because the organization understands that the world is changing. And if we look at the auto automotive industry, it's really being impacted by digitalization, by AI, by automation. Um, however, that organization has very much kind of the engineering mindset. So what they, what they do is they say, we need new job skills. Right. So mm -hmm. they kind of get it that they need to be recruiting people who have knowledge around AI or blockchain or, or you know, the other sort of in-demand technical skills. But I think what they fail to recognise is that what becomes perhaps even more important, I think this is what Salima alluded to earlier, is that, you know, you can have the best smart people in the world, you can have the best design thinking methodologies in the world, but actually if you're not attracting really creative people, you know, um, who are divergent thinkers and you're not looking at building diversity in your organization and not just, you know, gender diversity, but, you know, this company that I work for, they, they recruit graduates from a very select number of academic institutions because they define them as the smartest ones. But actually the people coming out of the top, you know, grad school, they're often not they're often smart in a technical sense, but they're not the most adaptive, creative, you know. So I think in the organization, HR just doesn't get it because, again, it's the old industrial world butler model, you know. The business says they need people trained in AI and blockchain and automation, so we find them most people. But what they're failing to understand is they also need, you know, people, and I think, Salima, you mentioned, you know, resilience, adaptability, and so on. There was also one of the questions that came up, um, and I think it was from, it was earlier on from one of the panel discussions, said, you know, what can HR be doing to be influencing more leadership on creative and innovation? I think this is a big one, you know, saying it doesn't help us to continue recruiting people who are clones of the kind of people we've already got, except they have some new technical skills. It's right. much bigger than it's much bigger than that. I'm not sure if you agree with me, Selena, but that, that for me is a problem because I think, you know, there, there are a lot of skills that are going to, there are a lot of jobs that are going to disappear. So, you know, this automotive company that I understand, understands it needs to reskill people or, you know, hire new people or in some cases even work or engage with organiz external organisations that are going to bring these new technical skills. But what the organisation is failing to understand is the need and the emergence of these new soft skills which are really not not present in the organization at the moment. I mean, Salim, I don't know if you agree in your experience with what, what you've seen. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting because I have interviewed, like I said, over 100 people for my book, and I always ask, mm. like, what, are, what do you think are the most important skills for the future of work? And a lot of people say, like, empathy, adaptability, uh, resilience, like, you know, all these different skills, listening, a lot of the human skills, a few have mentioned technology. Uh, but one thing that came up that I wanted to share was in one of my interviews, uh, Someone mentioned, someone talked about job crafting and the importance that's been around. That's a concept that's been around for a couple of. Uh, what, what, for, what was the term? I missed that. What was the term? Oh, the term job crafting. Job where what? It's the ability to really craft uh, your own job. Uh, there's job crafting. Okay. Crafting, okay. crafting. So there's a couple of definitions or concepts around this job crafting, whether it's. Um, I, I like the approach of the employee, the potential employee or consultant or whoever's coming on proposing like, you know, this is what mm -hmm. I would like to do based on this problem versus like 
someone that's not thinking about the solutions and maybe doesn't even fully understand the problem within the organization because they're so deep within the weeds of it, uh, trying to fit people into a box that doesn't attract the real problem solvers and the creative people. And so, and I find this very interesting because I think that, you know, job crafting, I've actually had some organizations, organizations reach out to me, hey, Salima, like, we'd love to have you on our team, but we don't know you, you do so many things, we don't know what box to fit you in. And so why don't mm -hmm. you just write your own job description, what you would like to do, what's going to make you happy, wow. what's going to make you stay, and what's going to keep you motivated, uh, and, and what would be the impact of that. And so that was very interesting, and I was like, wow, and that really took a very highly emotional, intelligent leader of a, of a company, mm. a small business, to um, to say that. And I was like, why don't more companies do this? Or why couldn't there be, like, I guess, this is the problem that we have, this is the type of person that we are looking for, a you know, box, and I think that we're creating these boxes by the time the or even when the job description is released, that role doesn't even really matter sometimes. It, they need something bigger because by the time someone comes in, there might be a new set of challenges. Um, and I think they need a certain person that can think using uh, like to the entrepreneurial or innovative way of thinking uh, to really understand the problem and, and having that problem solving skill set. Uh, and the ability to use design thinking and these innovative ways of thinking, like associative thinking, that, that they're able to sort of be, uh, you know, play brain hockey or, or connect the kind of like a dot connector uh, and connect things that seem unrelated. And I think that skill is going to be on the rise, especially we see right now in the world there, there's this trend of uh, becoming an entrepreneur. A lot of people are looking for autonomy and flexibility. Some companies are offering um, some of these things. However, a lot of people are trying to do their own thing and build their own brand, whether they're side hustling it or they're quitting their job and trying to start their own thing. And and unfortunately, we see a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of people are also failing at that. And why can't there be more collaboration uh, between the organizations and these people that are trying to do work independently? How can we actually create more synergies and actually, uh, you know, help the economy grow in ways that benefit both the individual and the organization versus them being siloed. And so I think that it, based on my interviews, that's something that's going to come up. There's going to be a lot more boutique firms that are helping organizations um, solve some of these problems on a project basis. Uh, and I think that's actually quite cost efficient sometimes versus bringing people in. Uh, I think that things are going to become more lean. Uh, I also think that, um, you know, with this rise of entrepreneurship, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot more independent consultants and people that are specializing uh, deeply in a specific subject. And uh, and I'd love to see what I talked about earlier, the job crafting. Like, I, I wonder how many organizations are going to adopt um, that. And that's something I'm writing about in my book. That's, uh, that's a, across all three of you, bring up some really good points. Um, that makes me, as I'm synthesizing what I've heard, uh, this notion of how do you, you know, balancing perhaps the more traditional models, as Jeff mentioned, having uh, structures that we, those industrial structures that we, that still are very relevant and still very viable now, and also looking at new ways in which people are working. And the, the challenge for HR right now is balancing both, because the reality is um, in most organizations, you have these two different paradigms. They're working at the same time. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, Salima, some of the points you've made about this idea of job crafting, um, perhaps for jobs that don't even yet exist, or it's not even clear what this job will look like, giving the person the, who's doing the work, who actually may have more knowledge of the work that they're doing, the opportunity to, to actually craft their own role. Uh, organizations could perhaps stand to benefit from that. So that's certainly a really interesting point. Uh, we have some of our participants who've been making some, who've been commenting, and one of them made a point uh, about HR recruitment uh, in many instances select and hire along general profiles and not always succeed in building the types of teams that can drive such innovation. So beyond these profiles, um, and, and all of you started to kind of, you started to allude to this. But how do you, uh, what thoughts do you have on that? Like, what can HR better do to move beyond just creating job profiles, but to looking at skills and uh, competencies and, and, and this whole job crafting um, idea? Jeff, do you want to have a go at that one? Sure. I think part of it is either picking up the phone or being in person or interacting with people because there's, there's, thin data or, or, or rows and columns kind of data, and there's thick data, the kind where you get a sense of the person and things that are harder to put in a box or a row or a column. So if you're looking for profiles, rather than to say, are you an extrovert or introvert? 
are you this or that? Again, you're forcing. Most people are a mix of a lot of things. Right. And the moment you're put into one box, traditional systems exclude you from something else. So I think maybe having a broader set of qualitative questions yeah. that whether a machine or, or a human is able to look at them and say, I can manage the team. There are some very uh, informal tools. One of my favorite, I'll give Ben Shapiro a nod of the head, is personality poker. You know, five minutes, you can put together diverse teams by noting certain characteristics. It's fun. It's more accurate than the Myers-Briggs and those types of things. And personalitypoker.net or something like that. Uh, it's a simple little game. And it, it's, it's fun. I got no stake in it. I just use it quite a bit. With uh, There are things like that that I think if it gets too formal, then people also shut down. I think by doing something that's not threatening, not sneaky, just, just very open, asking some questions, getting a balance. I think the, the important thing is act with speed and just regroup and evolve. Don't get it perfect. Don't get it completely right. Jump in, experiment, get it going. And if you've got some um, changes on the margin, like a person on a team or so, you add, you take away, that's great. But act. Act. And, and I think that the other thing about the HR is create a culture where it is okay to fail. The reason startups appear to be so cool is, well, you do that. You make a lot of mistakes and you grow, but they don't have as much to lose. And those two words are very, uh, they're, they're, they're nagging. They're called at scale. Whenever you do anything like your German automotive company, Jamie, they get a lot to lose. Yeah. Probably 100, 130 years of whatever tradition and growth they're trying to protect. And so I think respecting that and saying maybe they're deconstructing and make like W.L. Gore, you know, their plants never have more than a couple hundred people. You know why? No. It's small. You can do things, make experiments. So I think speed evolving and experiments, not as a nice to have, yeah. but embedding that deeper will allow the real humanity to come out. That's a, good point. Yeah. That's a wonderful point. And that leads to my next question um, about does HR have a moral obligation uh, to soften the impact, or, or maybe that's not the right word, but does it have an obligation to society uh, as a whole in terms of these changes that are happening, that are happening quickly, what responsibility does HR have to help usher in this age of future of work? Well, that depends on which uh, capitalist paradigm you're living in, I guess, right? Because I, I live in Western Europe where we have kind of progressive socialism, right? Where actually we, we, we take care of people at, in different rungs in society. Um, and that's that's a political system. That's very different to perhaps the, the system that you would have in the US. Um, so there is a fundamental difference, I think, here when we talk about moral obligation, um, because actually the moral obligation is always captured within a regulatory, a legal or a policy, policy frame. The big difference here in Europe, of course, I mean, if, you, if we compare the two systems, is that, you know, when, it, when a company needs to adapt, when it needs to change, you know, it can either hire new people, you know, and in doing so, fire the old ones, okay, um, or it can do a combination of hiring new people and retraining new people, i.e. not firing people, um, or it can work with external providers, you know, external vendors, you know, I mean, Jeff, you work with Infosys, so you're, you're in a company that's absolutely world class of, of doing stuff, you know, for, for companies because you have technology and you have competence and you're, you're very good at that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, again, if we talk about the different systems, well, you know, in, in a European context, you know, where I live, say, like in Belgium or in France, it's not so easy to fire people. You can't simply fire a lot of people and just hire the new ones that you need. So, I think in, in this kind of system, there is a much bigger emphasis in countries like Germany as well. Um, not so much just because of the socio-political system, but also because in Germany you have a lot of what are called Mittelstand, these mid-sized family, privately owned or foundation owned companies who have a real commitment to the communities within which they function. So in this situation where you have either the regulatory political situation where it's not so easy to fire people or in a, in a place like Germany where you do have this real commitment of privately owned companies to local communities, they invest much, much more in, in retraining and upskilling. Um, and I think what you also see there is certainly in the German case, you have a, a workforce which really appreciates the need to, to retrain and upskill. I mean, I saw some data recently that said, you know, if we look across the board, you know, by 2025, something like 50% of 
in people in the world today, work, workers in the world today, but particularly knowledge workers, they're going to have to upskill. And this study said that, you know, probably of that of that 50%, about 30% of those people will probably need to do at least six months kind of training. Um, you know, 10%, you know, so no, they said, yeah, of that 50%, um, they said it was like 80% would need to do something like six months. 10% would need to do something like 10 between six months and 12 months. And then the other 10% would need to, to get more than 12 months of upskilling or retraining. So if we look at a country like Germany, actually German companies do that. They invest in this sometimes six months, 12 months, even longer periods of, of training for their employees because they look at the long-term commitment to those people. I'm not so sure that in, in the US that, that there are a lot of companies who look at that long-term kind of return on investment. Uh, and therefore, I think in the US, you probably experience much, much more disruption uh, than we would perhaps see. And when I say disruption, of course, the people who are most at risk are the ones who companies often see less value in upskilling or retraining, right? Yeah. So that would be my, my, my answer. My answer depends, well, it depends on the frame. The, the socio-political uh, frame will differ, the level of disruption will differ depending on the systems. But I would suspect the US would experience much more disruption, particularly for blue-collar workers, than we would see in a country like Germany. Yes, and, and um, at the center of it, Jamie, you're correct, is the whole idea of upskilling and retraining um, yeah. to that question about what is the perhaps moral obligation, if any. Um, and so thank you for sharing the European perspective, and I certainly would love to hear Jeff and Sonima's perspective on this topic as well. I mean, I'm a former uh, management consultant. I've worked at large, some of the largest consulting, global consulting firms in the, in the world, and as part of their business model was constant training. Every year or, or every six months, we had to go through uh, multiple days of training in very different areas of our, of our work for us to stay relevant. So that's the school of thought perhaps I'm coming from. But again, then again, um, for those who are outside of the professional services model, um, that, that's not the case. Uh, so I would love to hear if either Jeff or Salima have any thoughts on this particular question. Yeah. Go ahead, Salima, you first. Yeah, sure. So I guess you can say a lot on this topic, um, but I guess in summary, to a lot of chief learning officers and I'm asking I'm very curious about the future of learning I the work that we used to do was a lot in the training industry and now it's become more consulting but uh, we realized that you know that 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 industry I mean it's being revolutionized right with like AR VR all these things happening technology the way people are learning the younger generations how learning and, and absorbing information there's just so much content out there and um, the internet has basically, you know, this information is very underpriced, right? You can get anything, you can learn anything these days um, through YouTube, through all sorts of different uh, learning platforms online. And so uh, I think that the way people learn is changing. I think a lot of these skills, like I don't think it just requires going to lots of training to upskill or reskill. I think there's certain times, I think there's more and more people are just needing to reinvent themselves and change careers. I think it's about adapting, being able to learn um, fast when you're recruiting. But I think with the, you know, maybe people that are in their mid to, to the end of their careers, maybe it doesn't make sense to upskill or reskill them. And maybe it, you, they just have to figure out like what's their sweet spot and what should they specialize in um, using, leveraging their skill set and learning what they need to do to deepen that. Or uh, if they want to make a career transition, I think that it doesn't make sense to just reskill and upskill everyone. Um, Cause that's, if they do get skilled up, then um, are they still going to be able to be the right person for that role? And I think that's what I'm concerned about. Um, I think that, there's different ways of learning and I think it's not just sitting in classroom based training. I think that's also changing very rapidly. Um, people can learn micro bits of information as they, as they need to. And I think that going to events like conferences, speaking, teaching, uh, learning by like doing and experiential, uh, there's all kinds of innovative uh, programs out there. 
that, uh, you know, in, like for example, Moving Worlds is one of them where you actually go do expert tiering um, in another country. Uh, for example, Microsoft, uh, you know, teaching like digital skills in Africa. There's all kinds of really interesting programs out there, uh, really helping people get out of their comfort zones. And I think that's a collaboration with like CSR sometimes in some organizations. And there's all kinds of different things. I know like Accenture has um, development partnerships. There's all sorts of different ways. And I think that um, it may not even be within the organization that they need to learn all these skills, especially the softer ones like adaptability and resilience. Um, mm -hmm. I think it really takes some, it takes putting them into a different context, if that makes sense. Because I think just sitting in a classroom and learning skills, or um, I think that's not going to work uh, as well as it used to because of the way learning has changed. Right. So, I mean, gone are the days where, you know, you can always go back to school. That's, that's how it was in the past, go back to school, get another degree. But now it's harder to do that. You know, um, getting an additional degree in the U.S. is extremely expensive, um, but there are a number of different tools out there that can certainly help someone and, and other, other alternative paths uh, that a person can take to keep themselves uh, relevant and, 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 um, and just uh, marketable uh, in, in the market. Uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Well, it's easy to get lost in the averages and also in the corner cases. Um, Europe is a different situation than the US, different situation than India, different situation in some other places. And uh, I have worked in most, most environments around the world and had employees and worked in those, both as clients as well as my own direct employees. And I think, I won't comment on Europe, I think Jamie's covered that well. I think in the US, I think this notion of the social contract, it goes both ways. Uh, I think the pendulum swung and people got too, too short term, I mean, management wise. Uh, I also think that as management thinks, their workforce is just going to learn something and move on. That probably crept into it as well. Uh, I think with the next generation, especially those entering the workforce, the data I've seen, they would like to stay somewhere for a while. They still want to be challenged and move and do all these things, but maybe. So, so I think there's an opportunity to get some of the best of what Jimmy mentioned about Germany uh, for all ages. And, and maybe ta everyone takes a step towards the middle, stay a little bit longer at a company, over invest a little bit, give people a chance, especially for economically viable ways of developing and delivering the training, especially where you can partner. So maybe you aren't the best at delivering everything, but maybe you can partner with someone for that AI training or someone else. I think it's one part. And then let's let's be honest as well. I work a lot with India and other parts of Asia, and there are economies where it's different. I mean, they're trying to do this with you add a zero, maybe two zeros, three zeros beyond no offense, but some of the places in Northern Europe, the size of Atlanta. You know, so you can do things in a, in a much more concentrated way. When you deal with something that's almost a billion or certainly hundreds of millions, especially with no capital, they're coming from a different perspective. Uh, I think those are some factors that does make it local. And I think maybe that word federated, you have an overall approach and you also are respectful of political regulatory and, and cultural norms that may, might be regional. And I just think there isn't a one size fits all. And I think by, by applying it, taking feedback, and getting as much bottoms up as you can, and then in the end, you buy with your heart, you justify with your head. You know, you. I still think the economics also support doing the right thing because to replace people, and at an organizational context and knowledge, in basketball we used to call it the no look passes. You can't do good collaboration unless you know each other, whether it's face to face, whether it's. A, a medium like this or whether it's just good collaboration and that takes time and there is a value to that and you have to articulate that value and that's when you can pay people more invest in them and maybe look beyond the next quarter no, I, I think that um, just to comment on that as well I, I think it's, it's a super I mean the, the interesting thing is I mean, if we look at the research right now on on you know I mean the reality is that most companies are focusing their their retraining and upskilling efforts on their most valued employees, right? So when you talk about the professional services firms, but whatever big firms you see, you know, a, a, a disproportion of their investment is going into those people who are already identified as being high value. The real issue, unfortunately, is that for the people who are most at risk from, you know, AI or automation, they're the ones who are currently receiving the least attention. From, from companies, and, and this is problematic. And, and there's a reason for that, because companies evaluate the return on investment, right? And I think this, this relates back to exactly what you said, Jeff, is that we need really to, to find 
new approaches, new platforms to, to upskill people cost effectively, right? And, and that is not in the old industrial way of putting people in a classroom, in a business school or in a training classroom, whatever it might have been. Um, that's important. But that also comes down to something which, and you know, Jeff, last year, I mean, you mentioned India. I was in India seven times last year. And I'm just blown away when I'm in India, when I'm in Bangalore with emphasis or when I'm in Hyderabad, the hunger that people have there to, to develop themselves. And not just the millennials that you meet, you know, the people that I meet who are in their 40s and 50s in India, they are busting, you know, to, to, to develop themselves, to learn new things. So I think it is also a little bit of a cultural issue where, you know, sometimes I meet people in Europe, I meet people in the US and they say, oh, it's too late for me, I'm in my 50s, you know, I'm in my late 40s. Well, in today's world, when you're in your late 40s or even into your 50s, you've still got 15 or 20 productive years ahead of you. So I think we also have an issue here around the mindset of the individual, you know. And I mentioned Germany. You know, it's not unusual for a person in Germany in their mid-40s to go back, literally to go back for 80 months to do a, to do a certificate course or to do a, you know, a, literally a, for, a formal study. And yet in our parts of the world, you know, well, where I come from, Australia or the US, you know, unless you're going back to do an executive MBA or something, very few people have that idea of going back to school. And yet they still have 20 years of life ahead of them. And I'm not saying it has to be formal education, but I, but I think there is a real mindset issue. I'm not sure if you agree, Selena, or people you've interacted with in companies, but, but we need to really confront that. that in our 40s or 50s, we still have 20 years of productive life ahead of us, and we absolutely need to be you know, embracing lifelong learning along the way to stay relevant. Yeah. Everyone, no, yeah. We have, oh, sorry. 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 Man. We have about four minutes and we have to end. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to us to move to the final question. Uh, we've had some great commentary from uh, some of our participants, uh, which was uh, very, very helpful. And um, but what we're going to do now is uh, wrap things up a bit because we have about four minutes left. Uh, so what I would like for each one of you to do is to um, answer this, if you could each uh, answer this final question and kind of uh, wrap up your, your thoughts for today's panel and this final question. From your vantage point, what areas do you think HR can maximize and value the most? And where can it have the greatest impact in the changes happening in the workforce now? Where can HR and leaders have the greatest impact and where can they maximize their value the most effectively? in the next few years, perhaps. Should I start? Selena, you want to have a go at it? Yeah, so I think that because people drive the business, it's not the products and services, it's the people that will make anything happen. Without the people, nothing is possible. Um, there are certain things that machines and robots just can't do. and, and that's where the people skills are going to be increasingly important, the human abilities, the, um, a lot of the things that we talked about, the soft skills. Uh, I think that it's really important to have more innovation leaders within HR uh, and attract those the types of people that we need uh, that can help connect the dots, especially since there's going to be more dot connecting within organizations, with organizations and, and their external partners and, and just the world in general. Um, and I think that just having more innovation within HR uh, is going to be necessary, however they structure it, uh, depending on the organization. So I just want to say that uh, having the mindset, we talked about the mindset, and Jamie had just mentioned a bit about this right now. I think that uh, cultivating an innovative mindset within HR, within the HR function, but also having the champions that can allow certain things to be tested, and, and even if it's you know, things fail, you get to iterate and try different things. I think that that's, that's really important to be able to um, have that, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Salima. Jeff or Jamie, who'd like to go next? Go ahead, okay. um, yeah, I, think I alluded to it already. I mean, for me, it's it's for HR really to, to build excitement and passion around lifelong learning and, and to, you know, look at the 75 year work life, you know, and, and, and not just to put in place the systems, but also to build the enthusiasm and passion. You know, I, I, there's this there's this horrible term that people are using right now. You know, they call people boomers, 
And, and what does that mean? They're saying like you're a boomer, which means you're stuck. You can't change. You can't learn. You can't evolve. And I just want to get rid of that term altogether because I think it's, it's generational kind of, you know, it's horrible, right? Um, so let's not think that just because somebody's a boomer, they can't grow, develop and learn. Let's, let's really support people to, uh, to be productive for, for much longer and make an investment in that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. And Jeff, uh, you get the final thoughts. Great. Well, complimenting what you said, both with an I and with an E, um, as, as executives or leaders in HR, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. So going back to the first point, bring your facts, bring a compassionate message, and go to somebody senior. Go to your president. Go to your CEO. And for the 95% of the firms who aren't what Jamie mentioned, about being enlightened and strategic and, and thinking about talent this way. Bring these ideas forward and help people see the true costs of not doing these things. Like it or not, people buy hope of gain, fear of loss. And if you show them what's really they're missing, the opportunity cost, some of these great ideas, I think we'll see the light of day. Um, the other is, the other thought is being resilient today is better than being cool. It isn't just about getting somebody in the door promising. You got to keep them. You got to train them, motivate them. And, and that's going to be the essence of it. So what are the kind of things you can do with your people that they're resilient? Obviously, skills help resiliency, building trust, all these things in your own life. So I think thinking about what underpins the word resilient in an organization on the human level, you feed into that, your company and you will be better off. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie, Jeff, Salima, for your wonderful insight. And I really enjoyed how this conversation really brought us back to the human element, the human-centered aspect of innovation, which innovation is not just methods and process and just creating technology, but really looking at the human element of how important that is. And as we are, uh, as we are working, what we can do more effectively to create environments that are inclusive, that also builds a greater resiliency, and that allows us to be able to solve through increasingly more complex challenges and problems we will continue to face. Um, as we see now, that yes, we are more connected, but in that connection, there are also new challenges are, being, are, are emerging and how we build our leadership skills and our way of thinking to solve these problems uh, are, are central to how we will continue to move forward in the next uh, decades or so. So again, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a wonderful panel. It's an honor for me to moderate this panel with all of you. I feel like I've learned so much. And, uh, um, and we are the last, uh, this is the last session for today, um, uh, and the last breakout session, I believe, for the, for the conference. So again, thank you. And um, I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Thank you. That's right, yeah. Th thanks a lot, Milka. And, and for everyone attending who's been listening in, yeah. please do reach out to us on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever you wanna, wanna do that. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see you at another Hacking HR event before too long. So thanks, yes. thanks Milka. Awesome, they've already scheduled next year's event. And yes. Like and others, yeah.